Hello world, Liu here, and today we will talk about 9 cool things that I never knew about Python functions until recently. Number 1. Functions in Python are actually first class functions. So this just means that a function is treated like a variable. So here, a function can be passed as an argument into another function. So let's define a at 10. So it takes in an x and it returns x plus 10. And next, let's define another function. So apply all, and this takes in a list, and it takes in another function. So out is equals to empty list, for i in this one, out append, and we apply this function to everything inside this one. And let's return out. So here I'm going to print apply all, and let's add the list, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And next, let's pass in our function we created here, at 10 into our apply all function. So once we run this, we'll get 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. And notice that we have just added 10 to 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So here, we have passed in our function as an argument into another function. So next, let's create another function at x, and let's have x here. So inside this function, I'm going to define another function, which we will return later. So define inner n and return n plus x and afterwards i'm going to return inner so here at 10 is equals to at x 10 and if we call our at 10 function at 10 to let's say 4 we will get 14. so here in our at x function we are actually constructing another function and this function is at 10. So let's do this, add 100 is equals to add x 100. And now if I add 100 to 4, we will get 104. So in this case, the add x function is actually returning another function. And lastly, let's define a test and let's print apple. And next, I'm going to set hello is equals to test. So right now, I'm assigning the test function to a variable hello. So if I call hello, because hello is actually a function, I'm going to print apple. And this is because hello is equals to test. Number two, functions can have attributes and inner functions. So here, I'm going to define a test function, and I'm just going to print hello here. And next, test.fruit is equals to apple. If I print test.fruit, I'm going to get apple. So here, Weirdly, we can assign a variable to a function. So because functions in Python are first class functions, we can actually assign a function as an attribute of another function. So here I'm going to define a test to, and here I'm going to print orange. And next I'm going to do this test.hello is equals to test to. And if I call test.hello, I'm going to have the exact same output as test to. So I'm going to print orange. And here we have it. Number three, we can actually make stuff happen inside a function after the return statement. So let's talk about a normal function first. So define hello. So print apple, print orange. So let's say return 100. And here we print pair. So in a normal function like this, nothing will happen after the return statement, which means that whatever we write after the return statement we will never run. So let's test this out, hello, and if we run this, we will get apple and orange only because print pair happens after the return statement. However, there is one hack that we can try to make stuff happen after the return statement and that is using try finally. So here, I'm going to indent this and I'm going to put this in a try block and I'm going to put this in a finally block. So here, whatever is inside our finally block will always run, even if it is after a return statement. So if we run this, we'll get apple, orange, and pear. So this functionality is usually used for tasks that must be executed. For instance, closing an open file. Number four, the yield keyword versus the return keyword in functions. So let's talk about the normal return function first. So define test one. And let's say we return 1, return 2, return 3. So here, if we print test 1, we will simply get 1. 
and this is because nothing happens after a return statement usually. However, let's comment this out and let's talk about the U keyword. So here I'm going to U1, U2, and U3. So here, if I call test2 normally, I'm going to get this thing here, a generator object test2 at some gibberish. So what this means is that we need to call test2 using a for loop. So for i in test2, and we print i. So if we run this again, we will get 1, 2, 3. So after a uq runs, the function does not stop, and the function continues going on until it reaches a return statement or the end of the function. Number five, we can use the code attribute to get function info dynamically. So here I'm just going to define a test function first. So test a and b, and I'm just going to return a plus b. So here I'm going to print this thing called test dot underscore underscore code followed by underscore underscore. So if I run this, we will get code object test at some gibberish. So while this does not tell us a lot about our function, the following things will. So firstly, let's do this test dot code dot co up count. So this co up count is actually the number of arguments that our function takes in. So if we run this, we will get two. And if we make our function take in more things, we will get three. Next, let's do this test dot code dot co name. So if we run this, we will get the name of the function, which is test. So we can do this too, test.code.callVarNames. And if we do this, we will get the names of the input arguments. So here we have A and B. And so if I add a C and D here, we will get a tuple containing A, B, C, and D. And next, we can do this, code.callFirstLine number. So if we run this, we'll get the line number of the first line of the function. So here, we have 3 because our function is at line 3. So let's say I make it at line 5. And if we run this again, we'll get 5. So there's actually much more functionality under this code attribute, but I'm not going to go into everything. Number 6, classes can be called like functions when we use the call magic method. So first, I'm going to create a normal class. So class dot and define in it self name h self name is equal to name and self h is equal to h. And next, I'm going to initialize a dot object. So Remy is equal to dot Remy and tree. So if I print Remy, I'm just going to get the normal gibberish that we usually get. So main dot dot object at something. However, if I try to call Remy, open and close bracket. I'm going to get an error. However, I can make it such that we can call an object like we call a function. And we can do that using the call magic method. So return, let's say it just prints its own name. So right now, if I run this, I'm going to get Remy. So if I want my callable object to take in more stuff, I can just simply do it here. So self name and x. So now I can pass in, let's say, apple. And if I run this, and I'm going to get Remy x is equal to apple. So with this call magic method, we can actually make our object behave like a function. Number seven, type hinting in functions. So let's write a normal function, define at, and let's say x comma y, and return x plus y. So we know in Python, we do not need to define the data types of the variables that we create. So here, we can call the add function with an integer, then 5, and we are going to get 15. Or we can do the same with a string, so 10 and 5. So if we pass in strings, we will get 105. However, there is actually a way to recommend a data type to a certain function, and that is to use type hinting. So after my variable, I add a colon and the type. So let's say x is supposed to be an integer, so I add a colon and I add int here. And same with y. So this means that x is supposed to be an integer and y is also supposed to be an integer. As for the return value of the functions, we write it before the colon. So we have a dash and an arrow and on the right of this arrow we have integer. So this means that the function is supposed to return an integer. 
However, do note that this does not actually enforce anything and this is just a recommendation. So if I choose to pass in two strings still, Python will still allow this and I'm still going to get 105. Number eight, arcs and quarks. So when we just started learning Python functions, we probably learned that the number of arguments that we can pass into the function is equal to the number of arguments that we define in the function. So let's say define average of a, b, and c. So I'm just going to write a plus b plus c divided by 3. So after defining this function, we can only call this function in one way, average, and we have to pass in three numbers. So if we run this, we are just going to get 5.0. However, if we try to add more stuff, we will get an error. And similarly, if we try to add less arguments here, we will also get an error. And this is because the average function will take in three and only three arguments. However, as we move on to more advanced functions, we can actually get rid of this constraint. So first, let's talk about how we can make a function take in any number of arguments. So I'm going to remove this. And here, I'm going to put star arcs. So here, I'm just going to print arcs first. So the star arcs here allow us to pass in any number of arguments into our function. So I'm going to do this average 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And if I run this, I'm going to get a tuple 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So what's happening is that whatever we pass into average is actually captured as a tuple named arcs. So here, if we want to pass in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, our tuple will simply become longer. And with this in mind, we can actually return the average of all of them. So we can return the sum of arcs divided by the length of arcs. Let's add a print. So if we run the code once again, we will get 4.0, which is the correct average of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. One thing to note is we do not necessarily need to call this arcs. So here, we can call arcs whatever we want, as long as it is a valid variable name. So let's call it numbers. And since we call it numbers above, we have to call it numbers below. So the important thing is actually this star here. So once again, if I run this, I'm still going to get 4.0. And now let's move on to quarks. So define test. And here, I'm going to put double star and quarks. And afterwards, I'm going to print quarks. So this double star quarks will actually allow us to pass in any number of keyword arguments. So here, I'm going to do this test x equals to 1, y equals to 2, and apple is equals to 3. So if I run my code, I'm going to get a dictionary contain x pointing to 1, y pointing to 2, and apple pointing to 3. So here, if I pass in even more stuff, let's say orange is equals to 4, and pear is equals to 5. And if I run my code once again, I'm going to get a longer dictionary. So similarly, we do not necessarily need to call it quarks and we can call it whatever we want as long as it is a valid Python variable name. So I can call it d if I want and I'm still going to get the same thing. And number nine, decorator functions. So if you have been working with Python for a while, you might have seen the add sign floating around. For example, define hello and we do our stuff and we have something here. So this is the decorator syntax and the thing after the add sign is a decorator. So in this case, something is our decorator function. So a decorator is actually a function that takes in another function. And we usually use it to modify the way a function behaves without having to modify the source code itself. So here, when we do this, we are actually doing the same as this. Hello is equals to something hello. So the add syntax is exactly the same as this. So let's work with a proper example. So first I'm going to define a grid function. So it's going to take in a name and it's going to return f string hello name. So if we print read tom, we will simply get hello tom. And next I'm going to add a decorator. So here, I want my decorator to add an additional exclamation mark after my return string. And I'm going to call it add exclamation. And once again, this is the same syntax as greet is equals to add exclamation greet. 
So since we haven't defined our add exclamation function, let's do it here. So define add exclamation. So here it has to take in a function. And here we have a function inside a function. So define wrapper. So this is the function that we want to return. And this function will take in the same thing as the function we want to decorate. So since we want to decorate grid, let's keep things simple and make it take in the same thing. So return function name and return wrapper. So right now, our decorator will actually do nothing to our function. So let's actually add an exclamation mark here. So if we run this, we will get hello Tom with an additional exclamation mark behind. And if we repeat this again, we will get two exclamation marks. So decorators are actually pretty useful if you have a certain function modification that you want to add across many functions. So thanks for watching and hopefully you have learned at least one new thing about Python functions today. See you in the next one.